wonderful voices up there. What do you think? That was uh, really good. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Paul Harvey used to always uh, say at the conclusion, he'd tell a little story that he'd say, and now the rest of us. And this morning we will focus on this. This is a pretty simplistic message, but oh, how profound. And uh, I think it impacts, if not all of us, the vast majority of everyone that is seated here. And we find ourselves in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. There were times I would sometimes sort of go through the Bible and think about the different characters in the Bible and maybe think of which one I'm more aligned with or uh, ones that I align with sometimes because of their struggles and their challenges. Other times you're able to see some of those things that you're gifted in and see a Bible character that may uh, have that same characteristic. And this morning I'm going to look because I believe the one that we can all relate to <coughs> is that we're all appalled in many ways. You, you see Paul, the first time I believe he's mentioned in the Bible is when he's watching over the clothing of the men that were stoning Stephen. Later on, he got to where he was even involved in going to the houses to get Christians out uh, to ultimately get rid of them, to have them killed. <coughs> so you first think of that. Now, hold on a second. How does that make me Paul-like? I don't think any of you have, have done that. But I think as we look at this, we can see a likeness to Paul. And in that, I think it just, it shows the love for Christ. It shows Christ's power, his strength. It changed Paul, and it has changed us. So first, uh, first Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. This is Paul speaking. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive <coughs> eternal life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you for this time. Father, message, while somewhat simple, is overwhelming. And Lord, today, Father God, I just pray that you just get me out of the way. I thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace. I'm able to stand before you and and in perfection, not because of who I am, but because of who you are. But Father God, today, no one needs to hear from me. They need to hear from you. So Father, I pray that I may decrease, that you may increase in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> now, as I talk a little bit about Paul, first we know about him. He's watching the clothes, the guys that were uh, stoning a, a godly man. And, and then we know that later on he, he begins to uh, actually have Christians persecuted. And he even, in fact, uh, calls himself an uh, evil man, a violent man. But let's look at those, some of those common characteristics that we have in Paul. Number one, in verse 15, Paul says... Here is a trustworthy say, saying that deserve for acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners 
of whom I am the worst. Paul says, I am a sinner. In fact, Paul says, I am the worst of the worst. And we can relate that we are all sinners. Now, folks, how long have you heard that? You've heard it. If you've been in church, you've heard it since you knee high to the We're all sinners. The only difference between us and non-believers is that we've given our life to Jesus Christ. We've been forgiven of our sins, but all are sinners. I don't know about you, but after you give your life to Jesus Christ, have you stopped sinning? Well, probably not. I sure haven't. But Paul says this, that he is, uh, again in verse 13, he says, Even though I was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. But again, Paul says in verse 15, Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Do you really think Paul was the worst sinner ever? I mean, Hitler has to rank somewhere there, doesn't he? We have terrorism that is unimaginable. So was Paul saying this for some kind of dramatic thing? Jesus came that he would save all sinners of me. I am the worst. The worst. I like some of those looks. That was pretty. Uh, anyway. <laughs> was it a dramatic statement for Paul? Paul wanted to say this. I want to. I just want to add some punch to it. Well, we also know that's not Paul's style. Paul's style is to sort of tell it like it is. But, so where did Paul come up with this? Well, you know, we, or, or how can we, if we believe this is an actual statement, then where did he get that statement? And should we be like Paul in the center, but not the worst? Have you ever thought about your relationship with Jesus Christ? And sometimes you hear people say this. Well, I'm not exactly doing what I want to do. But I'll tell you what, I'm a lot better than Billy Bob over here. And my goodness, I got a, na a neighbor named Martha, and you wouldn't believe her. She goes to church every Sunday, but I'll tell you what happens there. You can hear all kinds of feuding and fighting coming from that house. And I think in all in all, when I research myself, when I analyze myself, I'm pretty good. And though we wouldn't say this, and I know we don't mean that, but if we're not careful, we begin to say, and when I go to prayer, I think that uh, God don't have to spend as much time in forgiving me of my sins. That's Sound like Donald Trump now. Or I'm um, <laughs> I, guys, I don't get political. Don't uh, if you have any concerns with that, talk to me. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> Matthew. <laughs> All I will say is he don't have self-esteem issues. Wherever you feel better, get that. The Matthew chapter five. Just one verse in, in verse 48. Now, here is where we compare this worst sinner stuff. Be perfect. I'm already in trouble. <coughs> Therefore, as your heavenly Father is. When I compare myself, maybe, and listen, folks, we can always compare ourselves with somebody that we may feel are lower than us. It's sort of our way of doing things. And we do that at work, don't we? Don't you have a co-worker that you do part of their job and yours do? And is everybody else, Duh, do they not see it? Or have you ever had 
or somebody new comes on and you have to train them for the job that you thought you should get? Oh, that's always a fun one. <laughs> and sometimes, and I hope you wouldn't say it, but somebody goes, he's an idiot. Now listen, guys, don't get holier than now. So sometimes we have those moments, don't we? So it's, it's easy to take this that my sin, I'm not the worst of sinners. I'm a sinner, and, and really when you, I'm a competitive guy. I sort of like lists. I like top ten lists, top five lists, top this list, top that list. And I like to know where I'm on the list, and my plans are to be higher up on that list next time I see the list. So if we're not careful, and I know I'm being repetitive, but we, we get into this mode that <clears throat> I may fall short, but I don't nearly fall as short as But when Paul looked at it, and Paul understood that it says, be perfect, therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect, he says, I fall and I can't even make it on the list because as I look at what the expectations is be perfect therefore as your heavenly father is perfect I tell you when I analyze it when I resolve it all I am the chief of sinners I am the worst of sinners now isn't doesn't that make me feel good Hold on, what are you trying to get to the point here? No, that don't make me feel good. But Paul starts with that premise. In Ephesians chapter 5, it also says, in respect to this, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3 through 6. But among you there must not be even a, a, a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity are of greed because there are improper for God's holy people, nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For this, for of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater and has no, and has any, I'm sorry, let me try this one more time. Verse, um, Five, for this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one be deceived, you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners Because we're not perfect, and because that covers the multitude of sins, we at times can find ourselves in those sins. So that's Paul's point. I am the worst of sinners. And, and at this point, that's where we're at. My goodness, you have just been a breath of fresh air today, Jerry. <laughs> But we start with that premise, and now we have the rest of the story. Back in 1 Timothy, Paul goes on to say a few words. He is saved. Now, Sometimes you have to be careful in church using the word saved because somebody's, uh, somebody can say, I'm not lost. So we, we know, I believe, everyone here knows what I'm referring to, saved, salvation. God forgives us of our sins. So the rest of the story, Paul picks up in, and verses 13 and 14 again using some of those same verses. Even though I was once a blasphemer, 
and a persecutor and a violent man, I was also shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of the Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Jesus died for our sins. Now, isn't that another story you've heard since your childhood died? But when you start with the premise that just as Paul said, I am the worst of sinners, as I evaluate myself against the holiness of the Almighty God, I find myself saying, sinners, I'm a chief of them. <coughs> but Jesus died on the cross. Now folks, listen, if we understand the premise of the, how much we fail to be like God because He is perfect, then when we understand the act that took place on the cross, for me it is overwhelming. I realize my name is not in the Lamb's Book of Life because of anything I have done. Because listen, except for accepting what his work he did on the cross, that was my sole part of it. But, but if you do that, if you begin to say, I know Christ died for my sins. I understand that. But let's be honest. I wasn't such a horrible person. <coughs> and guys, in some ways, I can make a little bit of that argument. It's all in vain. You know, I, I've, I've never done drugs, never tried drugs. <coughs> One reason I think it's because I was a chicken because I heard of those, those things of, back in our time, it was marijuana. And um, I always heard of the bad batch and somebody got sick or died and I thought, I don't think so. I often got accused of being on something. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> but I found I could have a good time in life and didn't need the influence of somebody else to make me have a good time in life. <coughs> But if we do not fully understand that we are like Paul, chief of sinners, worst of sinners, then folks, the impact of the cross may not be what it should be in our lives. <coughs> see, when we're able to sing praises, and I'm not saying, listen, some people are more comfortable singing than others. I hope if you're not able to, to uh, audibly sing out, I hope you sing out in your heart. Pat Dodson, that my wife asked for a, uh, a prayer request for. Her. What had to be one of the worst singers I've ever heard in my life. I'm pretty sure the Holy Spirit I ever heard it say, turn it down. <laughs> but when those songs came out, most time Paul didn't, I mean, Paul. <coughs> Pat didn't need a hymn book. But if he did, he, whether he had a hymn or not, he flat out felt it out this. And you could tell it was a heart thing. And I tell you what, some of the most beautiful hymns I've ever heard sung was when I was standing beside Pat Knox. <coughs> and he just said, praise to God. Pat was always so honest. He would tell you where he had faltered, even to a fault, I guess you could say. You ever ask somebody to give you too much information? <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> so my friends, when we begin to sing the songs, when you're out somewhere at lunch and you see somebody bowing their head, and your mind goes to the cross, and you know I'm the chief, I'm the chief of sinners. I shouldn't even, I shouldn't even be in the realm of the presence of Almighty God, but because of Him, I am saved. 
I am free. My sins are washed away. The Bible says as far as the east is. And then when someone tells me about Jesus and someone begins to tell me the story of Jesus, that song, Tell Me the Story, over and over again, I've got, I'm probably mixing three or four hymns up here, but tell me the old, old story. Ah, oh, man, it just never gets old because it radically, radically changed my life and changed many of your lives as well. Amen? So in understanding what Paul's doing, uh, understanding the premise of it, that he is indeed a sinner, and that he had nothing to do with his salvation, less accepting the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, you see the impact. Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9. Very, very familiar passage. Oh, man. And, and guys, you know when you read this, you say, yeah. I understand. It's, it, it, is, it is what rocks my world. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves. Listen now. It is a gift of God. A gift of God. <clears throat> and yes, when you hear Christian music, when you talk about the Bible, when you're in a worship service, no matter where you're at, oh God, you can't even the gift. It's not from yourselves. Not by works so that no one can boast. It's all a Jesus thing. You know, Jesus loves us no matter what. Unconditional love, that's another one of those knee high to the duck things. I've heard that. Jesus loves us. I I happened to think about this yesterday. I was at my son's basketball game last two nights, and they're getting ready to be in the state tournament. But anyway, they, the night before, they lost the game. Played a good game, but just had a more talented team against them. Um, and I go into a longer dialogue with that, but we'll just leave it at that. Uh, after the game, I usually always go over and give Jacob a hug, and we usually talk before he goes back and screams at us, but no, before he talks to his uh, team. And um, and both nights he had moved back pretty quickly to go back into the locker room, so I waited outside. Night before last, in their loss, there were me and a couple of the parents there. Last night in their victory, the hallway was sort of lined up because they were victorious. And when I thought about that, guys, sometimes we have bad games in our life. And God doesn't want or does not expect His children then to walk like this. Now, maybe we may not literally walk like we're down on ourselves. And let me tell you, folks, maybe for some of you, the hardest person you have to deal with is the person you see in the mirror. And you beat yourself up. I was at another game. I got to move on for you. I don't really thought this was going to be a short message. I'm, I'm not going to apologize. <coughs> There was a guy at halftime of a game. I, I've been blessed enough to be able to see some of Jacob's uh, recent games. And this guy, probably 6'3 or something from the other opposing, uh, he was a fan of the opposing team. Long story, it got to this, that at halftime he came over to my son and went like this. you got to stop that. I don't get involved in anything. <laughs> 
But let's say he got my attention. Now, Jacob went on to the locker room after that. But when he came out, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't put a Superman on my back. Just when he came out, I just stood right beside that man. And I basically said, now he was taller than me, but I think I could kick and run. Anyway, I, <laughs> and he would track while I'm kicking him. But anyway, he was not going to touch my son. It just was not going to happen. So, what I'm saying is, if your child is being attacked somehow, some way. <clears throat> if it's within your power, you're going to stop that, right? Absolutely. Yet God sees his precious child sometimes being attacked by you, by yourself, that one in the mirror. And this morning, God wants to step in and says, leave my child alone. I died on the cross for you. You leave him alone. Guys, we've got to hear that. We've got to understand that. That's who God is. One final thing, the rest of the story. Then we become a servant, though the Bible says, really, that God don't want us to be his servants. He wants to be his friends because he wants you to know what's going on. But I'm okay with the name servant. Especially when it comes to God. God changes us. He saves us. And then we become his workers. For Paul, it was starting new churches. For you, it'll be something different. But it's all in serving and serving others. And it's about doing it with joy. Just serving others. And folks, it can be such a small thing that may, be careful now, it may be very small to you. But that one that you took the extra time with, the one you made an extra phone call to, the one you just said hi to, it can be <coughs> The conclusion is this that we reach in First Peter, uh, First Timothy. First Timothy chapter one. No wonder one looking right I was in First Thessalonians. <laughs> Verse seventeen. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God. Oh, can you see now what Paul's saying? Paul served other gods with a little G. And he says, I have found the one true God, nothing, no one, not one thing, takes the place of that God in my life. It's just one little word in there. Now to the King eternal, immortal, visible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Ah, may that be our goal in life. We're like Paul because we're the sinner. We're a sinner. Maybe he's the chief among those. We are saved and then we're able to serve him. Ah, oh, that's a glorious life. That's a life of joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word, Father. God, you're just so awesome. Sometimes, Father, I can't comprehend it all. It's really hard for me, Father, even as being a father, to, to understand it all. And, and even, Father, when we, uh, we sin, your love does not stop. You want to draw us closer back to you. So, Father, you are amazing. And Lord, this morning, we've just come to celebrate that. Celebrate who we are in you because of you, because of your grace, because of your mercy, not of what we've done. We're just celebrating that, Lord. We're celebrating being your children. 
And Father, for the maybe some here that just need to hear that story of the in the mirror. Father, today you say, leave my child alone. I died for that child. Father, we thank you for your love and your compassion and grace. Be with us during this time of invitation in Jesus' name. Stand with me, Lord. Something intense. All right. Amen.